the story that we have here, it's really a global story. It's a story that's been played out many, many times before. The Owens Valley is a place where Los Angeles went 100 years ago as they outgrew their own water resources locally and they dried up Owens Lake and they started to dry up Mono Lake. I get it, we need electricity and we need water in order to survive, but at the same time, there's a balance. We continue to pump, we continue to divert water. You know, at what cost is that coming? The fact of the matter is we do have rights to water there and we'll continue to do that in the long term. The question is how we export. As people drive up the valley, they would see it as a desert. It's been transformed into a desert. How do you own life? It gives you the authority to own life. Water, we call it paya. If you pray to it and talk to it, it has a spirit. It listens to people. I don't know, that concept is kind of hard for some people to get a hold of. But the water itself is life-giving and it's a doctor for us. time there was lots of water. I understand the old people used to talk about it, you know. I never seen it, but that's what they used to say. White men first come through this valley here. They chased all the animals out that we subsisted on. And our people, we just wanted to live, you know. White men had cattle, so I guess our people would kill those cattle once in a while, you know, just to eat, you know, survive. Then from there, it escalated. It got to the point where they had to have an army. Things finally settled down, I guess they killed enough of us off. In this domestication process, they made us servants of these ranchers. We cleaned white man houses and took care of the white man's animals, and, and they took the water too. They claimed all these waters. Water of life, you know, they own life. Who, who gives you the authority to own life? Who, who gives you that right? We don't get a whole lot of water here in precipitations. We have a lot of water that ends up being held in the Sierra as snow, and then that snow melts and comes down into the, into the valley, and, and as it's flowing down uh, into the, to the valley, we created a, a very extensive network of ditches to, to slow up the water, really. This is an old map from the 30s, somebody that came in to do a ethnography of our people. When you look at a, a county map or some other map like that, it's empty. <laughs> there's, there's nothing depicted on it. Just, you know, one city here, one city there, one mine here, one mine there. And it just showcases that what people saw was very different from what our people saw as a place, because for us, the place was full. Things like water rights, that whole concept was so foreign to our people 
that they never engaged with the conversation because they didn't understand the conversation. It's kind of like if, if I was to be sitting here in this chair and, and being able to breathe because I have an air right to be able to breathe in this chair, but then I don't get the next right to breathe until I'm 20 feet down the hallway where I can breathe again. Well, that's ridiculous when we think about it in modern terms, but that's exactly how our people thought of water rights, land ownership and property. It just didn't make a whole lot of sense. have retained the water rights that sit on the other lands, but we really don't have access to those waters. 1939 was a long time ago, and yet today we're really kind of stuck in a quagmire of what is our, our right for the future, because it's difficult to build a future when there's question marks about, <laughs> about water, which is life. <laughs> So this is where the water for Oak Creek enters the tribe, and then it goes down throughout the different diversions on the reservation. Being a Big Pine tribal member, just noticing the difference working with the Port Independence Community of Paiutes, a tribe that has a percentage of Oak Creek water rights, it's a tremendous difference as far as what they're able to do economically. They have a community garden that's using irrigation water. They have a travel plaza and casino. They have two new developments coming. This is going to be the Fort Independence Community um, Marijuana Dispensary, and it's going to be a drive through As it stands right now, I wouldn't say it's impossible for the Big Pine Reservation, but we just don't have the economic assets to do a startup of this nature. We don't really have any serious economic development for this tribe right now. If we were to have control over our own water systems and our own water tables, me personally, I would like to see a focus on healing the land. I think if we prioritized healing the land first, uh, things like economic sovereignty, economic development, uh, those all things would naturally fall into line. I'd like to see the Owens Dry Lake become the Owens Lake again. What has happened to that area creating, you know, one of the biggest single sources of air pollution in the country has had massive health effects for our people. Traditional areas where I would go gather willow with my mom are no longer there. I have a three-year-old daughter. We have to travel some distances to find pine nuts. If there's a drought, there's no pine nuts for her to gather. For years, she's lost that component of gathering with her family. Some people don't really understand. It's part of our culture, it's part of who we are. I get it, we need electricity, and we need water in order to survive, but at the same time, there's a balance in that balance is being disrupted and we're seeing as we continue to pump, we continue to divert water, you know, at what cost is that coming? As people drive up the valley, they, they would see it as a desert. It's been transformed into a desert. The droughts that we have and people are fearful of is something that we face basically every year here in, in Big Pine. And we just call it a manufactured drought because it's something that somebody else has determined we're going to move water out of an area and that water is going to be more than what is coming from, from recharge typically. That tension between 
rural areas and distant cities where the demand for water is very high, where the economic value of water is very high. That's been a problem going back literally centuries. Now we realize that the natural environment, the ecosystem also is critically dependent on the same water resources that the farms and the cities are competing over. And so that is part of our challenge today. The river itself, it's very sinuous in moving across the landscape. There's a lot of bows, and so it, it just allows the whole area to really flood across. Once we get down to the intake, it, everything is moving along you know, the aqueduct. Yep, and this is the beginning of the, the intake here. When they originally did this, it, it really did take all the flow of the river and, and move it into the intake. Then they were required as a mitigation measure to rewater uh, the Lower Owens River. Even though the mitigation is to alleviate some of the impact, what they don't want to do is alleviate the impact. So, so, so any, any mitigation project they do, they want to make sure that it's not going to impact their, their, their operations at all. Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is we do have rights to water there and we'll continue to do that in the long term. The question is how we export. Since 1991, when the long-term water agreement was signed, and, and the essence of that is that agreement is to, on the one side, to allow us to still uh, export water out there, but for the benefit of the Owens Valley is to maintain the vegetation that, that, that's up there, and you do that by monitoring plant health, groundwater levels, and again, those levels have stayed within you know a long-term average that's remained the same since the, since that pumping has began. There will continue to be exports in there, but there will also still be a strong environmental ethic on our part and a strong land management um, plans uh, and really a, a vibrant stewardship um, from Los Angeles in maintaining those lands up there. One of the consequences of climate change is going to be more and more impacts on our water resources, more and more extreme events, both flooding and drought. We had the most severe five-year drought on record from 2012 to 2016, and then the 2016-2017 water year was literally the wettest year on record. A wet year is a good thing for California, but it does not mean that we have solved our water problems. We haven't. And there's almost no place on the planet that's as vulnerable to climate change as California. Today, we are talking about climate change, but I think we're dealing with climate change because we live in a society of climate control. It means living in a hot desert, but never feeling the effects of living in that desert. When we remove ourselves from our local climate, the decisions we make have less to do with reality and more to do with our comfort. And so nobody's asking the question of is this, is this an appropriate place to be able to build? Do we have the appropriate resources for the future to sustain that growth? 2035, 2040 time period, we expect the city to grow by about 450,000 people, but we expect the demand for water to remain the same because of water conservation. There's still that much potential still sitting out there. In the future, we're going to source 70% of the water we need in, in Los Angeles locally. And that's a combination of uh, water conservation, recycled water, and, and groundwater. One of the realizations is that in the 21st century, the smart way to manage water, it's going to be a question of cooperation, not competition. As long as we think of water as a win-lose resource, as long as we think of water fights as winners versus losers, we're not gonna have a sustainable system. 
Uh, growing up in, in LA County has certainly provided me a, a certain element of, of viewpoint and, and understanding that I love the people of LA. Just as I love the people that, that I'm a part of here in my own community. And it's because of that love of people that causes me to move forward with these conversations. Because it's not about hating or just wanting to be a disruptor of things. It's really trying to help maneuver things so that all of us can have a future and grow in ways that otherwise just didn't seem possible.